touch it, smell through it, sense it, experiences come from it. It is integral and it is historical. We all use it when we taste wine. And there is none other than the Riddell glassware that has been with us through generations. Today's guest is none other than the current CEO, Maximilian Riddell. It gives me great honor and a pleasure to introduce to you a true living icon of a legendary family that contributes to the wine and the industry of glassware. Welcome to the show, Maximilian. Thank you so much for having me. Maximilian, 1756 was the year your family business of manufacturing glassware began. As of the 11th generation, you are the CEO of this company. There must be a weight that you carry on your shoulders historically, and not only as the CEO of a family dynasty. How do you cope and what do you believe is expected of you? Well, it is a very traditional place to be and company that I am allowed to run in the 11th generation. And of course, it comes with a lot of weight because you don't want to be caught being the last. Being the 11th generation means I need to bring up, educate, train, and motivate the 12th generation, just the same way like my father did prior with me. And there's always two to a parent. So obviously also my mom had great impact. And uh, it was my sister and myself who were brought up here in Austria. But my father decided very early on that we should learn how to work in the wine industry. So with all the connections that my father and my grandfather had built to winemakers from around the world, it was a given that he would send us off at very early age to do the harvest, something so simple, just to learn by doing everything we could about wine. And we are a glass company. So wine is, is fun. Wine is a topic that is obviously part of our everyday business, but it should be glass. And I think sometimes I know more about wine than I know about glass making. <laughs> and uh, it is my job to, to marry the two together, like it was done prior. And uh, I'm not the youngest anymore. I used to be, having lived all over the world, having spent 15 years in the United States and in Canada, in North America. Uh, I've learned the hard way. I've learned it the good way. And I earned my position. I have to be very honest with you, because it was not a given that my father would hand it either over to me or to my sister or to mm -hmm. management. The company is now at a certain size close to 400 million euros in terms of business. So it's a great responsibility that I'm, that I'm carrying. And I'm, I wear many hats, you know, um, next to running the business. I am the designer of the company, of the product for the Riedel brand. Uh, I'm the face of the company. You know, social media is something which has become very instrumental, very important to us. And so far, luck was on my side, and I have to reflect on the education truly given by my parents to me that made me fit for the position. Well, you mentioned uh, earlier on, uh, Maximilian, that it was not always a given that you would be given the helm of this company. So what uh, was the turning point you felt when your father actually told you Maximilian, you've proven yourself. Well, the turning point came when I was living in America. At the age of 22, I decided to move to the United States and to take responsibility of our largest subsidiary. We run our own company in North America, headquartered in Edison, New Jersey. Then it was on Long Island. I decided to move it to New Jersey just more central, closer to the port, only made sense. And I believe that uh, very early, we realized that I had fun doing what I was doing. 
I was developing new product. I was in the face of the best chefs in the world, which now are based in New York, based in California. And it was the booming of the wine society in North America. We're talking about 2000, 2005. Of course, American wine was known, but it was not yet there where we all see it nowadays. Yes. Correct. And um, and I was just surfing the wave of the success of wine in North America. And I remember very clearly my, my first internship, I had at Tiffany, Tiffany and Co. in New York. It was in 98. And I was a very young man. And I, of course, I had to fly from East Coast, West Coast. And people were drinking then in business class in the morning, Bloody Marys and other cocktails. And I remember in 2005, people were ordering a glass of wine. And I thought the country is moving in the right direction. And that's exactly how I see also how our business developed. We could not be successful in North America if there wouldn't be a relationship to wine, a wine production, um, the best wine publications. So there was wine with the kitchen, with the cuisine, with Top Chef being on TV, with wine events taking great uh, leads in North America. So it was a great time for me to be there. I was surrounded by the best of the industry from whom we're still learning today. I met Daniel Boulou at the right time, Chef Wolfgang Puck, Thomas Keller was just becoming the star that he is. So I was there at the right time. And uh, I think I proved to my father by, by, by being responsible for the market, by showing the growth which was always double digit when I was there in North America that I was taking great responsibility of the position that he gave me. So it wasn't just the exuberance of youth that you had, but it was also your ability to adapt, innovate and improvise. Now, clearly with that, it has to be channeled and focused. So prior to attaining the CEO position in 2013, your father, George Josef Riedel, mentored you, Maximilian. What wisdom did he impart to you that you remember so clearly? Well, a lot, a lot. And I, we wouldn't have enough time for me to mention it to you and to mention it to our audience. I was also lucky to have had a very close relationship to the man who invented the modern wine glass, which is Professor Klaus Riedel. Uh, his designs are in the Museum of Modern Art, the Corning Museum of Glass. So he has gotten a lot of respect from the industry, which was then the glass industry and tabletop industry. Let's not forget, tabletop was king. This is where us catered to and many other porcelain and glass and crystal brands uh, catered to. And he was a very recognized personnel. And it was his original design, less is more, during the Bauhaus. We're talking about the period of the Bauhaus. Yes. And, uh, and so he, give, he gave mental and physical birth to the modern wine glass, which then my father took to the next level, going grape varietal specific. Um, and I think that these were the stepping stones. So what my father taught me, not only be on time, be there ahead of time. Good. Make yourself a clear picture. Uh, spot the scenery, the audience, get behind it and be the best in what you can do. And um, he was, in terms of business, a very successful man, in terms of design, a very successful man, but he was also a very tough man. He ran marathons around the world. So he was mentally very strong. And I, I learned this from him uh, and the respect for the others as well. And the way how, he brought up uh, very loyal and valuable employees. And what I'm so keen on having him hopefully for a long time on my side, he knows glass making, you know, he knows not only wine and he could be challenged by anybody in the wine industry. He is on top. Every sommelier could learn from him still to date. And we're doing a lot of wine travels together because he still knows the old generation and I know the young generation and uh, also, most of the wineries are still a generational business, you know, so it's good to hang out with the young and the old and already oh, yes. now the next generation. So uh, it is, um, but that's what I think what he, he, he brought to me close is this kind of respect always to have 
also not only your mindset at the right place at the right time, but also go there with polished shoes. You know, it's it's the things around it that make the picture complete. That, that, that those are very wise words that uh, your father has shared, and thank you for sharing them with us and the audience, Maximilian. Now, as you mentioned, there's a generational change. You know, you're traveling with your with your father right now. Uh, he has the older generation. You represent the new generation. What's your particular vision for the company in the next two decades, Maximilian? Well, I would say we're being challenged nowadays with uh, different challenges than the generations prior. Uh, and I don't know where to start and where to end. I'm talking about the current situation. Europe, part of Europe is at war. Uh -huh. And this is a very serious threat. I'm talking about the conflict between the Ukraine and Russia, which is only 400 kilometers, about 300 miles away from where I'm sitting right now. Good. Uh, the American continent cannot even imagine this because all the wars in the last hundred years were all abroad, but not within. So this is something which uh, carries a uh, threat to myself, to my employees, to the families that we work with, to my customers. At the same time, we're talking about a limitation to our raw materials that we utilize to melt glass. We're talking about energy costs that are surreal. And not, I mean, just yourself, you go to the gas station, you see what I'm yes. talking about. But for us Europeans, it's even more threat because our gas that I need, 100% gas dependent to melt my glass. If it's in Austria in my factory or in my German factories, I depend 100% on the gas situation and the gas comes from Russia. So if Russia coughs, I have a big problem with my production. Next to going through Corona, COVID, uh, you know, all this are, are scenarios that maybe my father who was not really, who was born after World War II was not as, as much as impacted of course, there was the old crisis and there were other situations, of course. we are talking about the modern times. We're talking about going on, on social media and we see bombs hitting tanks like it was never so close and so real yes. as the situations are. So the people, the customer, the consumer is very uncertain. And I have to deal with this conflict and it's, it's not an easy situation that we're in right now. So I have my challenges as the generations prior had their challenges. So I wanna obviously navigate the company successful through those challenges and whatever comes with it. And we are a global player. Real is distributed in over 120 countries right now. So of course there are countries which are absolutely not impacted by the situation. Everybody was impacted by Corona but with the war, it's such a, yeah, you hear it on the news, but you don't feel it. We feel it. We go through this. And, um, and we thought after Corona, when it, 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 it calmed down in February, yes. March, the situation would improve and we would all go back to our normal lives. And I'm bringing up two small children right now. And the questions that they're asking me, it's not an easy time for us. No, not at all. And we're very sympathetic to to all the Europeans. And as you mentioned, it's so close, it's very real, and uh, it is there right at the forefront. And we certainly yeah. hope that this conflict can be resolved uh, within a very short space of time, as it does affect the world in one way or another from every single country. And the other thing that impacts us, of course, is global warming, something that we have not been talking about for the last six, seven months, at least not in my surroundings, but it has a great impact on wine and winemaking. So you're asking me, where do I lead the company? Yes. I have to keep up with all the trends, you know? Uh, um, we see the alcohol percentage in our wines uh, growing. That's the reason why the wine glasses become bigger uh, to deal with these kind of alcohol levels. Um, and with the situation, Alcohol for me is also not only a result of fashion in wine, it's a result of global warming for sure. Then we're dealing with new terroir. Uh, wines from uh, overseas are becoming popular. Then rosé is something that 
the Americans very little talked about five years ago. Rosé is dominant now in North America. I remember the Prosecco boom that we had in North America. Europe's Europeans always drank Prosecco, uh, but now it's in North America. Then, of course, we're surrounded by, and we're very happy, Hollywood making great movies related to wine. Um, and then, of course, there is this trend of delicious sparkling wine from England, uh, which sooner or later could become superior. I know that people don't want to hear it, but it's a fact to champagne just because of climate, same terroir, further north. So these are all, I would say, the fun challenges in my world versus what I was talking about prior. Of course. L let me ask you a question there. You know, um, China is one of the, the leading uh, consumer markets. And uh, it's very clear that our, our physical uh, attributes are very different to say the Europeans, especially with the nose. So Europeans have this nose, which um, is long, narrow, Romanesque. Yes, Maximilian, you are exactly <laughs> the, 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 the stereotype that exudes all the wonderful attributes of being able to nose a wine perfectly. Now, with, with, the, with the Asians, and you know, I would put myself into that category, I don't have such a, a lovely nose or with that bridge. And my question is, do you adjust your glass shape form for the Asian market? And I, and I bring this up because Giorgio Armani are one of my, my favorite sunglasses that I use. And uh, I bought a, uh, a, a set of sunglasses a while ago in Venice and I lost them unfortunately, but the lenses were glass. And I scoured in Europe, in Asia, actually, to find a replacement. But the lenses were not glass. They were high quality sort of plastic. And I said, why? And they said, because the bridge of Asians cannot take that weight. Very so smart. my question to you. Yeah, very smart. So do you make any adjustments for that yet or thought about so it? The very good, very good question. Obviously, I was confronted with this question prior. It just because our physics, um, our looks are, are different, we still smell the same way, my point of view. And we have done these tests, of course. So just because my nose sticks maybe into the glass two inches longer than anybody else's nose, it doesn't mean that I smell the wine better or different. Let's leave it at that. What we have done for various Asian markets, mm -hmm. it's, it's also all in Asia, is very traditional. They have very traditional beverages. Let's just talk about Japan and sake. I think every sommelier nowadays, no matter where he or she is located, should know a lot about sake because it's a great, it's one of the great beverages in this world. So uh, the craftsmanship is amazing. Uh, so I made glasses specific for sake with the Japanese. And if we Europeans drink sake from that glass, it makes absolutely no difference. So interesting is, though, that, for example, we made a glass for Krug Champagne, Krug Champagne, mm -hmm. which is a glass called Joseph Krug, which we developed together with the family, of course, with LVMH behind it. And for the Japanese market, we, not we, they asked for a smaller sized glass. So the same, but reduced in size. Just reduced, right. Just reduced in size. It obviously did not work and perform in the same way. It could not show the aromas, oh. but it suited perfectly into the traditional setting of the table, table setting. And if you ask a porcelain company, what porcelain do you sell globally? versus the Asian market, there's a big difference because there's traditional different ways of eating. We're talking yes. about chopsticks and things like this. But when it comes to the performance of the nose in the glass, I have to say, sadly, I cannot adjust or adopt because it would have such an impact on the way how we smell the various nuances of wine, spirits, beer, and other beverages. Well, that's... Um scientifically proven and uh 
fact. And, and that's a fact. Now, there are those who will fight to the death for wine glasses to have the stem. What inspired you to come up with the O Glassware series? And I'm not sure if you actually have uh, one of the O Glassware series with you there that perhaps you can just show us. Yes. So obviously, let's show you my latest creation. That's the new Riedel Veloce glass. That's the Cabernet glass. Uh -huh. And uh, to identify it, you have also on the bottom, I don't know if you can see it here, you have it real Cabernet Merlot. Yes. Because, yeah, nowadays we have for most of the most popular grape variety a glass, and some could very look similar to others, and I don't want that there's a confusion in your cabinets. So when you drink Cabernet, you should definitely reach out to the Cabernet glass. And obviously when you get a gift or you forget over time, that's the new human being that's the circle of life. That's the reason why I dare to put it now on the base of the glass. So I lived in New York for a very long time. I lived typical New York City, small apartment. I love wine. I want to drink wine, but I didn't have the space to store all the various glasses. So wow. what did I do? I made more space by chopping off the stem. And here you would have uh, a glass which is stemless good so it meant that i could store stacking the stemless glasses two to have the same space need as one stemmed glass so that was one of the main reasons was the question of stem of space space then i realized when i took off the stem that the performance did not change very important then I realized that wine glasses are also used in the bar environment. Many bars around the world use wine glasses for cocktails. Yes. But the stem was always in the way because they are working the cocktail and what breaks is always the stem, the never stem. the bottle. So I offered for the bar a stemless version. So that's already two check marks that worked very well. Then I thought sitting on the, on the porch or, or when you go to a picnic or when you go casual, let's say just you go casual, the stem is always in your way. If it's in your basket, carrying it from A to Z. If it is because when you're outdoors, you tend to tip over a glass, the stemless bounces back up. It's like a weevil wobble. The stemmed one might break. Good. So the casual way of approaching wine. Then of course, many wineries, no space, barrel tasting, barrel sampling, very complicated with a stemmed glass. The stemless glass fits into the dishwasher. So, so many things. And all of a sudden I also pushed the chefs from around the world in a new direction. Because what is amazing from a stemless glass is if you serve food in it, because for the first time you can nose the food, you can drink a soup. So all of a sudden I gave a, a wine glass a multi-purpose use. And I believe that's why it became the most successful introduction of a real product to the world. And I measure success two ways, of course, how many do I sell and how many times do I get copied? And I would say there is not a single glass company in the world who did not copy my concept of a stemless glass. Well, thank you for that insight, Maximilian. You know, it, it, it is all, it, it has captured still the effectiveness of the shape and the style, yet it now embodies and captures practicality. Now, do you also extend that uh, to being the principal designer of the company's decanters, do those factors also come into it when you are considering the design of a decanter? Well, first of all, I have to say that when you would visit us here in Austria, and everybody can is invited to do this, our, our workshop, I like to call it a workshop, our factory, and I'm pointing this direction, which is right next to me here in Kufstein, Austria, mm -hmm. uh, close to Munich, close to Salzburg. So in case somebody wants to visit us, please do so. Um, it, is, it, is, it is fantasy world because the people working, and we have close to 170 glassmakers employed here, 
uh, in Kufstein, um, when you see and watch them, how they make a decanter, how they craft a decanter, how much skill there needs to go into it, and you realize that every decanter is a unique piece. Uh, first of all, the price no longer matters because it is, it's like a Picasso that you take from the wall and you can do something with it, you know? A decanter is for me a tool, it's an instrument. It's an object that you wanna utilize every day and people are always afraid, how do I wash it? Let's first use it because, before you think about how washing it. Let's do, deal away with the complication. Let's just say, what can the decanter do for wine? There are two reasons why I would suggest to decant wine. I would add a third one when I come to it. Reason number one, the traditional reason is to split the wine from sediment. And we all know how sediment develops and builds up in a nice bottle of wine. This is also where it becomes romantic in a restaurant. People light a candle and then they slowly uh, decant the wine. Honestly, either you have collected wine your entire life to afford old vintages or you have a big budget to spend because yes. when you go to restaurants and all the vintage comes always with a high ticket price because somebody had to do the job for you somebody had to age it somebody had to offer the space the climate the surrounding for a nice bottle to proper age and that's the reason why an older bottle of wine which then was maybe cheap to buy and to store or less expensive yes. let's put it this way but this process of storing it becomes very expensive. And that's the reason why I see less and less the traditional way decanting a bottle of wine and sediment builds up over time. It does not happen from one day to the next. Good. Yeah. So that's the original way. That's the traditional way. And then we have the modern way because of the reasons young wine, especially modern young wines, take a long time to mature. And I give you a very good example, Chateau Latour. They're bringing to the market now a bottle of wine which was aging in their cellar at Latour, first grows Bordeaux, for at least six to eight years because the winery thinks the wine needs that time to be at a level where we at the authority, the winemaker says, this is now ready to drink or you keep it for another 20, 30, 40 years. And that has become a very big trend in the industry. I see this also with our Austrian winemakers, that they keep certain quality wines longer, kept away before they release it, because wine needs time. It needs time to age. It needs time to mature. And I use nowadays a decanter to wake up the wine. Sometimes I shake the wine in my decanter. And I'm not ruining it because not I think at people all. have yet, had yet to got, get the education. Some people are being brought up in some very fine and uh, expensive um, sommelier courses or educational courses. But I feel like the, the teachers need to go out and really realize what's changing in the wine industry. And the change can go very quickly nowadays. You know? So we need to wake up the wines and we are shock decanting wine, or we're using a very modern riddle decanter where we have the impact of double decanting wine. And I will leave this up to you, to your future courses to explain what double decanting means. So I would say a riddle decanter is beautiful in design, an object of desire. It's the best you can get when it comes to decanters, when it comes to the skills of a glass maker. And it is necessary to utilize it for every young vintage bottle of wine, being it red, being it white, could be champagne, oh. could be rosé. And I definitely feel that rosé wines need, we drink them, we buy them young, we, we, we are taught to drink them young, but they're not done yet. These wines also develop. So we need to wake them up, we need to shake them, but important, ladies and gentlemen, is not to lose the temperature of these wines. Good. Certain wines need to be served at the, at, the, at the perfect temperature and the decanter should not hinder us of doing this. So I like to use for white wines, champagnes and maybe rosé wines, decanters that fit into an ice bucket or into your fridge, not to lose the temperature. You know, uh, Maximilian, I think what you've mentioned there, very few, uh, even professionals out there, 
as you have said, they don't like to shock the system. They are very gentle. And yet the new style of wines being made now demand that. And um, you're right. The, this, this is a, the double decanting uh, methodology yeah. is something that uh, we'll be sharing yeah. very soon. Perhaps and, what we could do is uh, even have a series on that with you. For sure. And I, I want to I want to tell everybody that this is not the glassmaker Maximilian Riedel giving this advice. Good. I would never dare to talk without respect about wine. I am just repeating what I being what I am being taught by the best, most well-known winemakers in the world. The door for, for the, of these wine icons are always open to my family. And I mentioned with my father, I like to visit once a quarter, we go to a region and I'm just soaking up and, and I'm just realizing their dream, a winemaker dream. They say, yeah, and I feel bad selling you this wine. It's not ready. Please put it into your cellar. Of course, this is a different talk than what the salespeople would tell you. Good. Yes. But I'm sucking it in and I want to give those winemakers the chance to present the wine right away. I want to give them the bigger wine glass that does the job. I want to give them the decanter that allows them to open up these wines so that a la minute, a point, when they serve the wine, it is ready to be consumed. And um, that is something that is missing. You know, um, there's a, this tradition that one always uses. But what I love is your enthusiasm and we're cut from the very same cloth. We want to be at the cutting edge of new trends. And um, for our audience out there, I invite you to really explore and go beyond what you think is the boundary for you right now. And, and talking about tradition, Maximilian, you know, the question has always been raised by many, does the shape of the glass truly make a difference in the taste of the wine? For those who think this is not the case, what advice would you share with them? So first of all, I would suggest that everybody who gets the chance visits one of our, I would say by now, famous real glass comparison tastings. We conduct them all over the world. Go to riedel.com, find a location near you where you can sit in, participate, where you get the same wine served in different shaped glasses, smell, taste. Let me tell you, what proves the fact that the glass can make a difference? Invite a winemaker, serve his wine blind in different shaped glasses. <laughs> I bet you that in some glasses, the winemaker will not recognize his baby, his wine, that he was bringing up over months, holding hand, making sure, and at the end, blending it to his palate. Let's not forget this. The wines that we taste are actually blended by people to their enjoyment, to their palate, and everybody tastes different. Uh, that's why I also say I don't have a problem when somebody criticizes a wine. That's, uh, that's one opinion, which must not be my opinion. It could be my opinion. And uh, so that's, I would say that's proof enough. And if somebody tells me one shape fits all, a so-called so univers, then the person I need to criticize and say, is, you have no clue and no respect for wine, zero. Because you cannot tell me that Cabernet is the same fruit as Pinot Noir. And Pinot Noir is the same fruit as Chardonnay. And Chardonnay has similarities with Grüner Wildliner from Austria. It's impossible. I always like to compare it to the game of golf. Mm -hmm. I just started the game of golf and I started with club number nine. But if somebody can play nine or more holes with the same club number nine, then either you did not listen to your tutor that it's, you shouldn't do this for many reasons, or you play the game from, from early morning until late evening because you can't get the ball finally into the hole. And it's just the same, you know, it's the game of wine and wine is complicated. I think that the charm of wine lies within the complication. And I don't have to talk about terroir, 
different regions. Just think about your favorite wine from a favorite vineyard and compare one vintage to the next. There's yes. Very little in common. It is such a natural product. And thank God it is. That's the reason why there are wine enthusiasts like yourself, like myself, like the people who listen to this conversation. Wine is complicated. And yes, it is an investment to have different shaped real glasses to begin with. But let's not forget, it's, it's, it's a minor investment in comparison to the different wines that you open. You go to a restaurant, you feel good, you have something to celebrate. You make an investment. You're not stopping at $20 a bottle of wine. Maybe you go to $80 or because it's special, you go to $150. And then you get it in a glass that maybe looks like this, a tumbler for water, the extreme way you will not get the satisfaction from it because you will miss out on the beauty, on the different layers of parfum, of aroma, of molecules. Only a real glass can bring this to your senses. And this is the beauty of wine. Wine speaks to all of our senses. And uh, I think that the real glass is the messenger. It's the sound system for music, as it is the sound system, so to say, for your wine. And if I love you that invest, analogy. If you invest money into wine, don't be short. Don't take the short way. Don't take it the easy way. You need to invest in proper glassware. I would agree with you 100% there. I've taken the uh, Riddell tasting um, uh, exercise, you know, with the same wine. And, and it's quite amazing uh, be, being a... I would consider myself a, a veteran in the world of wine. So for our audience out there, I would encourage you to go out and find a location where you can undertake this exercise yourself. Now, having said that. Or, or let me just add here, very simple. Take from whatever you have in your kitchen cabinet, different shaped glasses, open a bottle of wine that you're familiar with, with your spouse and pour it into the different vessels you will be amazed that how it smells different how it flows different my glass is the conveyor belt it conveys the message if it's to my nose if it's to my palate and it's a fine-tuned tool and please everybody listening understand i did not shape these glasses myself there is always the wine industry involved the winemakers from around the world. If I make a glass for Sauvignon Blanc, it is not Sauvignon Blanc from Austria alone. It's Sauvignon Blanc from France, from New Zealand, all the way to North America. I invite the best winemakers to assist me, to craft it, to shape it, to design it so that they say, this is the way I see my Sauvignon Blanc. And you have conveyed the message. Job well done. And I think that's why Riedel is a global player. And that's why we're the most successful glass company. Because you are building a community and you change and you evolve according to the needs of the market. And we listen to what the winemakers have to say. Talking about listening, what are your thoughts on the rise of canned wines? And ultimately, do you think it may well give an increased rise to well, let's have a can of wine and let's forget about the glasses. Well, I, first thing I would suggest is that you don't drink the wine from the can because, and we did work very close with other beverages such as Coca-Cola, good? That's exactly uh, the idea of Coca-Cola. You used to open a bottle and you drink it to refresh it. Very few people ever actually smelled Coca-Cola. Doesn't smell that bad, just to go to the extreme. So if it would drink wine directly from the can, it's like beer aficionados. We have made beer glasses for the best beers of North America. We have worked with them on shaping an IPA glass, a stout glass, a wheat glass, and we've worked with the industry. And also there, people need to be much more educated about the great beers of North America. Uh, also of Canada. Let's not forget Canada. We have done this, by the way. Anyhow, um, fact is that we should uh, 
people should try it, you know, people should experience it, people must experience it. And when we talk about canned wine, I remember the success of Sofia Coppola. She introduced about 10 years ago, a beautiful rosé sparkling wine. And she was the first one to sell it that I remember in a can. Very hip, very trendy. And I have no problem with it because it will bring in young people, new people to the concept of wine. They will not get stuck with wine in the can. So I'm not against it. I'm only against the fact that people would drink it from the can as they would drink many other beverages. And wine is all about parfum. Most people, 70% of wine enjoyment is by nosing the wine, the parfum, good. And, and, and I fear that this would get lost and this would be very sad. Yes, um, it's one of the senses that uh, gives us the most uh, joy. Now, talking about joy on a personal level, there is food that touches the soul. What is the perfect soul food and wine pairing for you, Maximilian? And of course, the glassware you would select. Well, let's try it first, something that everybody can try at home. Chocolate and wine. People wrote books about it. And we were working very close with Lindt chocolate, which is one of the premium chocolates from Switzerland, from Europe. And uh, we were asked to pair different kinds of chocolate, mm. dark to milk to white chocolate and many others to a grape variety. And what, what is really fun, obviously, is dark chocolate. I would say up to 80% dark chocolate with Cabernet, everything above and beyond with Syrah, no doubt. Mm -hmm. But white chocolate or milk chocolate with Pinot Noir, <gasps> imagine heaven. A match in wow. heaven, Chocolate. ladies Chocolate. and gentlemen, must try. Of course, I'm Austrian. We like Wiener Schnitzel and we drink Riesling or Grüner Weltliner. That's another match in heaven. <laughs> and let's not forget classic white truffle with Nebbiolo. No doubt. No doubt. No doubt. One of my favorites too. So for the audience who are not familiar, Grüner Weltliner is one of the classic Austrian wines and... Uh, I would certainly recommend it, especially if you like that little sort of white peppery finish. Absolutely. Now, now, Maximilian, would you like to see your son, Franz Joseph, to eventually succeed you as the head of the Riddell company when of he course. becomes of age? Of course, of course. So Franz Joseph or his sister Helena, uh, they also have uh, three cousins uh, who are very keen. Uh, I think my sister is doing a fine job as well, bringing up her sons. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is my goal. It must be my, my crusade. <laughs> um, and if not, I failed. Because so far, from generation to generation, the business was handed over. And all the parents did a great job in shaping and assisting uh, the next generation to get on board. And I have to do the same with my spouse. Now, your spouse is Brazilian. Yes, Rosana is from Brazil. We met in London. We had our first years together in New York. And now we live in Austria. So I, I, I hope you enjoy some Brazilian cuisine as well. Every day. And what most people don't know, it's a country in the South that produces great wines. And I would call the national grape variety, domination is sparkling wine, sparkling wine from the South. But the national grape variety, I would say is Merlot. They do a Merlot. great job in producing Merlot in the South. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's something uh, certainly worth trying. Now, my last question to you, Maximilian, because you've given us huge insight into your personal tastes, what your thoughts are for the future. What advice would you like to share with wine drinkers across the globe to increase their enjoyment of wine, apart from glassware? So I would like to answer this in, 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 in many different ways, because there are people who are new to, to the world of wine. And what I would highly suggest, take some courses, learn about wine. Um, 
whatever whatever knowledge you can take in, I think will influence heavily the way how you approach wine, how you judge wine, what budget you will make available to wine. Then I would say the biggest key to success is to travel. Nothing can replace a trip to a winery, getting in front of a winemaker, walking through a vineyard, understand what terroir means, understand that it's a natural product. It's the only food that does not have an expiration date. Have you ever thought about this? And um, read a lot. It is something where there will be always somebody who knows more about wine than you do. So never feel bad. Don't feel put into a corner by friends who, yeah, have been maybe exposed to wine through their parents, have traveled the world. It's a never ending story. And this will be also your love and passion for wine. It will be never ending. Caution, really caution. Don't catch yourself drinking alone. Always share it. Wine unites us and water divides us. Well, on that note, it's been a huge privilege, Maximilian Riddell. Thank you for your time and for being on our show. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. I always learn from discussions such as this. I learn more uh, about your audience, but I also learn a lot about myself. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Please comment, like, share, or subscribe to our videos.